Good evening, everybody. Um, I am here from the Bahamas National Trust, partnering with Alive um, for an eco series. And we're just waiting for people to join, giving people some time to join the live. Good evening, my name is Gloria Miller. I am from the Bahamas National Trust. I'm partnering with Alive for an eco-series that we are doing with them. And we're just giving some people some time to join the live. So happy that you guys are joining us this evening. Good day. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining. My name is Gloria Miller. I'm from the Bahamas National Trust. Um, we are partnering with Alive to present an eco series. I'm so glad to have you guys join us this evening. I'm just waiting for some more people to join. Uh, Good evening. Hello, Loretta Boodle Harriet. Hello, Betty Ramsey. Okay. okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening again. Um, my name is Gloria Miller. I'm a senior education officer at the Bahamas National Trust. Um, we are partnering with Alive for this eco presentation. I'm so glad to have you guys join us this evening. Um, and we're about to get started. The topic for this evening is sustainable living. All right, so today's topic is sustainable living and I'll be talking to you all about 10 environmentally friendly things you can incorporate into your lifestyle. All right, so today's agenda, um, I'll do introductions of myself and the Bahamas National Trust, as well as the icebreaker, a sustainability pep talk, and then I will go on with the 10 environmentally sustainable things that you guys can practice. So a little bit about me, as I said earlier, I'm a senior education officer at the Bahamas National Trust. Um, I have been involved with the Bahamas National Trust since high school. I would volunteer at the yearly jollification in the craft section or with the rotary van. Um, when I was in college, um, one summer I volunteered with the education department for the entire summer. Um, this photo here at the top, um, the top left, well, the top left on my side, it is from the last day of EcoCamp. So EcoCamp is a 10-day immersive um, wilderness camp for Bahamian teenagers. They spend 10 days on Andros and they snorkel, they bird watch camp. Um, we learn how to make food outdoors at a campsite. We hike. Um, we learn different environmental topics. So this was the last day of that camp. Um, we're so grateful that we had a live sponsoring that event um, a few times in the past. 
And then I also uh, go to classrooms, go to schools and do presentations on the environment. So this is a photo of that here. Um, I also manage the National Park Experience Program. So this program um, involves taking students into our national parks, um, giving them tours of our national parks and teaching them an environmental topic while they're there. Um, this middle photo was from our citizen science program. And so that program takes people who aren't necessarily trained scientists into the environment to do, um, present, to do um, data collection and help us with monitoring our national parks. Um, this group in the middle was at Bonefish Pond National Park doing data collection with us. Um, and then we also talk to people who visit our national parks. They may not be Bahamians or they may just be visiting for a few months. So this bottom photo here is a photo of um, some people who are boaters in the Exumas. And they spent a couple months here on boats. And so I was talking to them about the role of the BNT as well as um, environmentally sustainable, sustainable practices that they can implement while they are in Exuma. And then we also do career fairs. And so this photo is from a um, Earth Day at the New Providence Community Center. So we do set up different booths at different events to talk about the environment as well. So a little bit about the Bahamas National Trust. We are a nonprofit organization that manages national parks in the Bahamas. We currently manage 32 national parks within the Bahamas, and these national parks protect diverse ecosystems. So these are all photos of different national parks here in the Bahamas. Um, we protect the pine forest ecosystem, we protect the ocean, um, mangrove ecosystems, blue holes, coppice forests, black land and white land coppice forests. Um, and these are, we're protecting them so that the species population that lives there, that they remain healthy and intact, as well as um, future generations can also enjoy the natural spaces that we enjoy right now. Um, the national parks are open to the public. So we implore anybody to visit our national parks. If you haven't visited, we have 32 across all of the Bohemian Islands. And so I implore you to visit our website, bnt.bs, to find out which national park is on the island that you live on so that you can visit one. They're very, very cool to visit. And you see all kind of um, species and unique aspects of the Bohemian environment that you wouldn't normally see um, in your everyday activity, going to work or going to school and what have you. All right, so I have a little icebreaker. Um, it's called, what are you more concerned about? So I want you guys to think about these different things to assess within yourself, which one are you more concerned about? And feel free to type an answer in the chat if you want to. So my first question is, are you more concerned about plastic pollution or deforestation? Which one are you more concerned about? All right, my next question. Are you more concerned about food scarcity? Okay, I see somebody said they're more concerned about deforestation. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, somebody said they're more concerned about plastic pollution. Okay, someone said that's a tough one, interesting. <laughs> All right, my next question is, are you more concerned about food scarcity or floodings? Which one are you more concerned about? Okay. Okay, Lane Scott says she's more concerned about floodings. Okay. Some people say food scarcity. Some people say flooding. All right, someone said security. Okay, deforestation and flooding, flooding. All right, a lot of people are more concerned about flooding, I think it's because we recently had a lot of rain. <laughs> so that's at the forefront of people's minds. Interesting. All right, my last question. Are you more concerned about dangerous heat waves or rising sea levels? Which one is more concerning to you? Oh, okay, Michael said he's more concerned about scarcity for that last question. Okay, I got you, Michael. Okay, rising sea levels. All right. Yeah, rising sea levels. I think I'm more concerned about that one as well. Okay, heat waves. All right. 
Okay, interesting. It's interesting to see <laughs> as long as we feel keeps my power on rising sea levels is what Lean Scott says. Okay. <laughs> all right, rising sea levels. All right, awesome. Thank you all for answering my questions. I feel like I know you guys a little bit better. I love icebreakers in all my presentations. I feel like I know the audience a lot better when they do them. All right, so now I'm gonna start off with a pep talk. I'm gonna be your sustainability coach for tonight. And I'm gonna give you a little pep talk before I show you guys the 10 sustainable practices. So first part of my pep talk, I wanna talk about what it means to be environmentally friendly. So according to the Cambridge Dictionary, um, when things are environmentally friendly, they are designed to have little or no damaging effect on the environment. All right, pep talk part two. Implementing a sustainable habit is easier than you think. So I want you guys to be open-minded about this process. Um, a lot of people think it's a, it's a big task to take on or they love to change their whole life um, or do things that they don't like to do, but it's a lot easier than that that you think. And you can do things that you still like to do. <laughs> All right, part three of my pep talk is take baby steps. So start off with us making a small change in your lifestyle, maybe changing something that you didn't mind um, doing anyway or didn't mind changing. Don't change something that you love or so are so passionate about right away. We can come back to that hard stuff later. So just start off by taking baby steps. So if you like your two meats or three meats with your Sunday meal, maybe starting off by being a vegetarian is not a baby step for you. Maybe that is a fly. <laughs> so we're gonna start off very slowly. Um, part four of my pep talk, don't give up on being sustainable just because you tried something once and it didn't work for you. So um, some people, one example is what I hear a lot is with the paper straw. Some people hate the paper straws. They tried it once, the straw dissolved in their drink. They were upset. They want plastic straws again. They're like, where are the plastic straws? I hate these paper straws. And don't just give up on being sustainable with your drinks just because one paper straw didn't work for you. You know, there are some paper straws that are stronger, or there are also metal straws you can try. There are glass straws, or you can just not use a straw at all. I remember before the plastic band um, was implemented in the Bahamas, I would just tell people at restaurants, I'd tell the server not to bring me a straw with my drink because I didn't want to use a plastic straw. I just drank from the cup. So there are so many different options. If one environmentally um, sustainable solution doesn't work for you, you can try something else. All right, pep talk part four. So I'm going to talk about my journey and how I got started um, implementing um, environmentally friendly practices in my lifestyle. So for me, it started with a class that I took in college. During my freshman year, I took um, Environmental Studies 101, or the, whatever the first Environmental Studies course was. And my professor gave us a project. We had to choose one environmentally friendly lifestyle change to implement. And she told us the same thing that I told you guys. She was like, don't take a big leap. Like, make sure it's something that you can actually do for this month because we had to do this for a whole month. She ensured us that, you know, we weren't graded based on the impact that it had on the environment, but based on um, how committed we were to this process and how well we kept up with our journal. So there was no pressure to, you know, go and buy an electric vehicle for this class. We, we could start off as slowly as we wanted to. And so I had no idea what I was going to do. I looked around my room and I went to the closet and I, I opened the closet and I saw I had this big Target bag. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Target and got like a big product and they gave you this tall plastic bag. So I had this tall plastic bag that was filled with plastic bags in it. And I couldn't bring myself to throw these plastic bags away because I know that would be terrible for the environment. And I kept telling myself that I would use these plastic bags again. But clearly I wasn't because I had this big bag full of plastic bags. So I was like, this is going to be my project. I'm going to stop using plastic bags. And so I went on to Old Navy. I got a $2 reusable bag. It was cute. It had hearts. I was excited to use it. And that is what I implemented. That was my baby step. And that is how I started making an environmentally friendly change in my lifestyle. Um, and it worked out. And now I'm doing other things. But it started with my first step. That was easy for me to do. So I chose to stop using plastic bags because I understood how long they take to biodegrade. Um, plastic bags typically take 10 to 20 years to biodegrade. So this table that I'm showing you all is the table of different things and how long they take to um, decompose. And 
plastic bags, they take a long time. And even after they do break down into these small particles, they never actually leave the environment. So they kind of just settle and accumulate as nanoparticles or microparticles. Um, a plastic bottle, as you can see, will take 450 years. A disposable diaper takes 450 years. So different products take a long time um, to break down in our environment. So the microplastics dilemma, as I said earlier, like um, these microplastics, they never actually leave our environment. They kind of stay there for years. And so there was a European study um, that kind of tracked these microplastics and what happens to them. And they found that, so when these microplastics are left in the ocean, the fish eat them. And then when they're left in the soil, you know, they get, um, they are in the soil and they end up in our fruits and our vegetables. So between the fish, between the fruits and the vegetables, where these plastics end up, they average that every human eats about five grams of plastic a week. And that's about the size of a credit card. So I have this nice juicy salad here with a credit card because that is how much plastic they are predicting that humans are eating a week. And if we continue to create plastic products, use plastic products and just throw them away, um, haphazardly, not caring, um, we're going to accumulate even more microplastics or nanoplastics in our environment. And instead of just having one credit card a week, we'll probably be consuming 10, 20. I mean, in my great, great, great grandchildren probably be eating about 30 credit cards a week in plastic if we keep up going at the rate that we're going and we're, we, we don't think about being sustainable about our lifestyle. So I'm going to hop into it now with my 10 environmentally friendly things that you can incorporate into your lifestyle. And I'm pretty sure you're probably doing some of these things already. All right. The first thing, using soap bars instead of body wash is one thing that you can do to help out the planet. So it's great if you're making your own soap bars. That's even better. But even if you are buying the soap from the stores, you know, that is more environmentally friendly than buying a plastic bottle <laughs> full of body wash. So soap bars are normally come in like a, a cardboard box, a thin cardboard box. And maybe they'll have like a thin plastic if you buy like the big uh, value box of the, the soap. It'll probably come in a plastic around that. But even that little plastic is less than an entire body wash um, bottle that has that is made out of plastic. So if you are doing that, you are already doing something sustainable. And I know what you guys are thinking. So you like your sweet smelling body wash, but there are a lot of companies that are making their um, scented um, body wash in soap form. So they're making like soap versions to their scented scented soaps. I saw that Bath and Body Works the other day were advertising their soap bars and their different scents that are also come in their body wash. So you can actually consciously make that effort to switch over to soap instead of body wash. Number two is reuse old clothing as rags. So that old shirt that has a million holes or got bleach stains all over it, instead of just throwing it out, you can use it as a rag to clean things, to wash your car, to clean things around your house. Um, instead of buying a new cloth to do these things with. You can reuse something. All right, you can also use bamboo toothbrushes instead of the regular plastic toothbrush. So I currently use a, a bamboo toothbrush. It is quite fine. I mean, it's it feels normal to me. The only difference is that I'm holding on to a bamboo, a wooden handle instead of a plastic handle. And then the toothbrush that I have, actually, the bristles are made out of charcoal. So it's actually even even more better for the environment. Um, and then if you're an electric toothbrush user and you are afraid to change, they have bamboo electric toothbrushes as well. So you can fully commit to this lifestyle and switch from that plastic toothbrush that I said is only going to accumulate in the environment and add to that credit card of plastic that you're eating and use a bamboo toothbrush instead. All right, you can use a reusable water bottle and utensil. So you can have a reusable water bottle that you take with you. I have mine's right here. I take mine's everywhere with me. And it also saves me money because when I get hot and thirsty on these Bohemian roads, I have my water bottle with me. I don't have to stop anywhere and spend money and buy water. Um, also, utensils, instead of getting the utensils when you order takeout from these restaurants, if you have your own utensils already in your bag or in your car, you can use that. And that's already one less thing being used and being dumped into the environment because we only use those utensils once and then we throw them away with the container. 
we can refuse juvenile species. So um, Bahamians love conch, <laughs> like conch, crack conch, conch salad, the whole thing. Uh, one thing that you could do is be informed about what a, ju a juvenile conch looks like and what a mature conch looks like. So a lot of people look at conch shells and they think a big conch shell means that the conch is mature. Um, and that's not necessarily true. As you can see in this photo here, this first conch shell is a lot bigger than this one, but this one is the mature conch and this one is immature. And so what you have to look out for is the lip. So if the lip is curled and it is as thick, it is a half inch thick, so that's as thick as the diameter of a penny, that means that conch is mature. If it is not, like this juvenile guy here, um, that means the conch is immature. And if possible, like when you get your conch salad, if they still have the conch shells around, you can ask to see, hey, can you show me the conch shell where you got that conch? And if it's a juvenile, you can say, okay, no thanks, I don't want that conch. And even um, educate them, let them know why you don't want the conch, let them know that, you know, we can't keep killing our juvenile conch, our juvenile species, because we won't have more for future generations. Um, as well as our crawfish. So the crawfish tail has to be five and a half inches long in order for it to be mature. So any of those small little crawfish, I know a lot of people like to sell them small little crawfish in a bag and call it a special. It is not a special. You are killing out our crawfish species. So make sure that your crawfish is an appropriate length as well uh, before you dive in. And this is all about supply and demand. So if we tell our fishermen that we don't want the, the juvenile species, um, they'll stop fishing it because then they won't be making money from it anymore. But it takes us to tell them, okay, we don't want this anymore and not create a demand for it. These are some open and closed season, fishing seasons also to look out for. So we should, uh, we should also be refusing these species during their closed season. And the closed season is just a time where they can reproduce so that their population thrives and that we have these species, um, that these species exist for a longer period of time. So the Nassau grouper has a closed season from December 1st to February 28th. The crawfish season has a closed season from, the crawfish has a closed season from April 1st to July 31st. And the stone crab has a closed season from June 1st to October 15th. Um, and so during these times, you know, if you see anybody trying to serve you crawfish, grouper, stone crab, you can let them know. Um, you don't want it. I don't care if you people. Some people say, "Oh, it's been in my freezer since the open season." I don't. I don't even eat it like that because I don't. I want to flee from the very appearance of eating food during the closed season. Okay, another thing that you can do to help out the environment is rent clothing or purchase used clothing. Um, so. Like if you're having a prom event or if you have a, a ball or a wedding and you need a tux, instead of buying a brand new tux that you're only gonna, or a brand new dress that you're only gonna wear once, you can rent the clothing for that one time and then somebody else can use it after you. And that way we're not wasting clothes or the clothes isn't just sitting in your closet, um, getting old um, and being not being used properly. Um, and you can also purchase used clothing. So um, I recently heard about the Cancer Society having a shop where you can actually donate used clothing and then also purchase used clothing and gowns and stuff like that. And there are other places around the Bahamas where you can purchase um, used clothing instead of purchasing new clothing. Um, another thing is, you know, there's, there's this um, fashion trend going on where a lot of companies are selling clothing, but it's like inferior quality clothing. So you only get like one or two wears and then you can't wear this clothes anymore. So it's basically a waste of material, a waste of fabric. Um, so just be conscious about, you know, the type of clothes you are purchasing. Even if you do purchase brand new clothes, be conscious about um, where they're getting this clothes made. How are they treating the labor laws and how they're treating the people who are making these clothes? Um, I know there was a country where the, they had impoverished people making these clothes in, in a building that had no fire exits. And this building caught on fire and the people were jumping out the window um, trying to escape this fire. And it's this company clearly didn't care about their workers. Um, a lot of people think that environmentalists only care about trees and plants, but a huge part about being a good environmentalist is also caring about people as well and making sure that proper labor laws are being enforced and people are being treated with respect and treated properly. So do some research on the clothing companies for the clothes that you are buying as well to be a good environmentalist. All right, so action number seven is purchase items that have little to no plastic packaging. 
So one dad giveaway are fruits. Fruits and vegetables have no plastic packaging that they come in. But if you must purchase items in plastic packaging, maybe you can try and not get. I know some companies, they have their um, their food or their snacks and like individually wrapped packages. So instead of getting those, that box, maybe get like a big box where they're not individually wrapped. And then you can like put your put little portions in reusable containers. And that way you're using less plastic or less packaging um, with your products. You can also turn off lights and electronic devices when they are not in use and also unplug them when, when you're not using them. Uh, some people are so extreme, they unplug everything except the refrigerator. So that's, that's something, another practice you can um, put into your daily lifestyle. But making sure that the sink, the water faucet is off, or if you have a leaky faucet, making sure to get that fixed quickly. Um, most TVs have a sleep button, like a sleep timer. So if you know you're about to fall asleep, instead of leaving, or you're sleeping, you're watching something, instead of leaving it on all night, you can have your timer on for like an hour or half an hour, whenever you think you're going to fall asleep, and um, the TV will turn off. Or you can even use these electric, or these energy efficient light bulbs. Um, they are a little bit more pricey. They're a little bit pricier than your average light bulb in the in the store, but it'll save you a lot of money on your electric bill. They typically last longer, and you're also helping out the environment. So you win at the end. And if you like have to buy new appliances, like maybe a new fridge, a new washer, um, try to um, purchase an energy efficient um, refrigerator or an energy efficient washer or dryer um, to help the environment. And this will also help you save money on your light bulb. Um, we can also reduce, refuse, and reuse. So I talked a little bit about this, but reducing is only purchase only what you need. Oh, Betty said her sister unplugs a few things. Awesome. Your sister's already on the ball. <laughs> All right. So you can reduce, you can purchase only what you need. You can choose products with environmentally friendly packaging. So maybe things that are in like uh, cardboard packaging instead of plastic packaging. Uh, buy items in bulk. Usually when you buy items in bulk like this, um, for example, this picture I have here of this lady carrying all these, I think this toilet tissue or, or napkins. So normally if you would just buy one roll of napkin or one roll of toilet tissue, that'll have its own plastic. So each of these toilet tissue rolls will have its own little plastic um, casing or plastic wrapping. But if you buy it in a big bulk like that, it's just uh, it's a lot less plastic wrapping being used for the same products and the same amount of products. And then normally when you buy items in bulk, it's cheaper too. So you're saving money. And then you can select items that can be reused as well instead of single use items. Okay, you can refuse. So I talked about this earlier about refusing juvenile species and refusing species when they're in their closed season. But you can also refuse things that you don't need. Um, and you can refuse, yeah, and refuse species during the juvenile season. Yeah, I covered all that already. And then you can reuse things. So also, like I said, you can reuse a water bottle. When you get food containers from the store, you can reuse those, reuse the butter container or the cookie container that you get that comes with a plastic lid. You can really reuse all of that. Um, also, you can even make different activities with or different or repurpose things. Sorry about that. You can repurpose certain materials. So like you can use a cardboard box from a cereal to make activities for your children if you have children around the house. Or um, you can even use that to write things down on that cardboard box if you cut up that cereal box. So think about different ways that you can use certain items around your house instead of buying new items. And number 10, my last um, environmentally sustainable lifestyle tip is to recreational activities that don't require electricity. So in this photo, this is somebody kayaking at one of our national parks. Um, our national parks are great for recreational activities like kayaking and bird watching that don't require um, using electricity or even like looking at plants, sniffing the plants, looking at the animals that live there. Um, but you can also ride a bike, you can go jogging, you can play volleyball. There are so many different activities that you can do to still have fun that don't require electricity. So I want to encourage you to just think a little deeper instead of just um, having a movie night. Think about what you can do that wouldn't require electricity, but that can still be fun. All right, so I have two bonus 
tips for you all. So the first bonus is follow an environmental um, sustainable or sustainable lifestyle page on social media. So those are great for encouraging you to continue to um, think about the environment and be environmentally conscious. And they also post like sometimes they get um, brand deals. So a lot of times they post like these environmentally friendly products that you can use as an alternative to a product that you're already using. Um, and just keep you encouraged to think about the environment. And a bonus number two is to keep indoor plants. So a lot of people don't have, maybe have the backyard space or maybe, you know, aren't able to plant a garden outside, but you can keep some indoor plants in your yard and they're good for purifying the air. Um, they're good for people who have allergies and helping the air stay clean um, for them. So I'm gonna leave you all with a challenge. You can feel free to comment what you're gonna do in the chat, but I wanna encourage you guys or challenge you guys to choose one environmentally friendly thing to implement tomorrow. So it doesn't have to be something from my list. It could be something else that you've heard of that's an environmentally friendly lifestyle change for you. But what is one thing that you can do tomorrow? So you have all night to plan for this um, and implement it in your lifestyle. All right. I just want to end by asking, thank you guys so much for being a great audience. Thank you guys for chatting with me in the chat, answering my questions earlier. Please remember to follow us um, on Facebook at Bahamas National Trust, on Instagram at Bahamas National Trust, on Twitter at BNT Bahamas, and also check out our website, bnt.bs, um, to visit one of our national parks that can be near you. Okay, so Nicolette, Nicolette said aloe is a great one. Okay, yeah, it is a great one, Nicolette. And then she also said she's gonna take a reusable bottle to work for her water. Awesome, I'm excited, I'm excited. <laughs> great, does anybody have any questions before we end? Oh, are there any stores that sell bamboo toothbrushes in Nassau? Okay, so yeah, so I got my bamboo toothbrush from Lowe's in Harbor Bay, um, but there are probably other, maybe other food stores that sell them or other pharmacies that sell them. And I know there are like some people who sell sustainable products. I can't think of any of their names right now, unfortunately, but I'm pretty sure that they also sell bamboo toothbrushes. I didn't see any electric bamboo toothbrushes in Nassau though. I think you'd have to buy that one online. Oh, Lynn Scott said she already does most of these things. Oh, Lynn, okay. Well, that's amazing that you do most of those things. <laughs> awesome. Oh, Betty Ramsey says it's very enjoyable. Thank you, Betty. It was great having you here. It was great having you all here. Okay. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I wanna thank you all um, again. Once again, this is a partnership with Alive. This is our eco series. Next week, we'll be having another talk. One of my colleagues will be back next week as well for another eco talk. And then the following week, another um, BNT staff will be giving a talk. So please tune in to the Alive Facebook and YouTube pages for the rest of these talks and visit us on social media. Have a great night, everybody.